Good evening, and welcome to the Burnsville Parks and Natural Resource Commission meeting for Monday, November 20th, 2017. Our first item of the business this evening is to approve the agenda. Are there any items that commissioners would like to add or amend for the agenda this evening? No. Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion approved. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Tweeney, second by Commissioner Donaldson. Um, and uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye as well. It is so moved. Our second item for the evening is for uh, citizen comment. Are there any citizens that would like to comment on any issues that are not already listed on the agenda for later this evening? Okay, seeing none, uh, we would like to move to the third item of business this evening, which is to approve the minutes. Um, we have two meetings to, uh, of minutes to approve. That is for a meeting on September 18 and a work session for October 23rd. Uh, are there any items that commissioners would like to amend or add to those minutes. Um, I would like to um, point out that myself and Commissioner Brammer were not present for the work session on October 23rd. And if there's um, no other items commissioners would like to amend for those minutes, do we have um, a motion to approve those minutes? Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Tweedy. And second. second by Commissioner Ralph. Um, all in fair for approval? Aye. 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 Aye as well, and it's so moved. That brings us to the fourth item of business for this evening, which is the uh, Wetland Health Evaluation Program WEP update. And to present that for us this evening, we have Diane Rouse. Well, thank you for your time tonight. My name is Diane Rouse, and I I've worked as the team leader for the City of Burnsville's Wetland Health Evaluation Program team. And um, I'd like to tell you about the program and the, what the results were for this year's field work. Uh, the work has been going on in the City of Burnsville for about 20 years every summer. There's a team of volunteers led by a team leader like myself uh, going out to uh, explore in the wetlands to f uh, gather data about the health of the wetland and then come out with a score for each wetland. So. Um, all right, and I do have a handout. Uh, the handout uh, was prepared by Liz Forbes, who's our city lia liaison for this project. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, you might wonder what is WEP, as we call it, Wetland Health Evaluation Program. It's a uh, citizen science in its best form. It, um, takes teams of volunteers, gives them excellent high quality training on how to identify bugs or little critters that live in the wetlands and the plants that live in and around the wetlands and then how to do the um, protocol to come out with a score for each wetland. And it's a program that's uh, in both Hennepin County and Dakota County in m most of the cities and some of the watershed districts also have teams. In Dakota County last year, there were 10 cities participating, about 112 volunteers. Um, just a great project. And um, it really started, I think the very first team <coughs> for the whole program was in Burnsville when they were just developing it. And the, um, the protocol, the, the way of figuring out the health of the wetland, it was developed by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency staff. And um, even now, every year, there are quality control checks in place um, in two different ways, or maybe it's three different ways. We have um, one thing is each wetland, each WEP team, like our Burnsville team, goes to a wetland in another city. So my team went to a wetland in Egan, and their team came out to one of our wetlands. And we do the same work on somebody else's wetland, and that the, the professionals will um, compare the data, and then also the professional biologists will go out and do some of the same work. They'll go do the plant survey in the, exactly the same place, like we leave our stakes marking the place where we did our survey. And all that is to compare the results, and they come out really well. So it's a great um, uh, protocol. That we, we start out in the spring with volunteer training and then get right, get right into the field. In June, we're looking at the bugs or little macroinvertebrates in the ponds. And then in July, we look at the wetland plants. Uh, we, I had a team of um, 12 volunteers this year. Two are in the audience. Can you raise your hands? Nick and Bernie. And um, 
just a wonderful team. They were very dependable. So we went out sometimes three times a week to, to do this work, sometimes twice a week. And um, you, might, you might wonder why we'd monitor wetlands. Like, who cares? Well, they're, they're very cool places. Um, they have all these properties where they act as a filter, a sponge, a nursery, where, they're, where the baby insects, like baby dragonflies, live in the water until they become adults. Um, hotel for visiting birds or visiting other, other animals, you know, kind of a place where they can rest and refuel, or it may, they may live there, would be part of the food chain. And then also recreation destination for people. It's, they're just a very rich environment. So um, I mentioned we, we monitor two parts of the wetland community. The macroinvertebrates would include the beetles and bugs and dragonflies and little critters that live in the water for part of their lives. And then the wetland plants, uh, you rec rec probably recognize the cattails and the lily pads, and there's many, many other kinds. And uh, one of the really neat things about the project is uh, you don't have to be a total expert to know exactly what the plant or the bug is if we can get it down to the um, genus, we don't have to just des designate the species, so we can just you know, get it in the right ballpark, say it's an aster, you know, that is enough to count it. And uh, the macroinvertebrates um, spend a big part of their lives in the water or in the wetland environment, so their presence or absence and their abundance gives us a clue of how healthy the wetland is, and some of those uh, critters, like for example the dragonfly larvae, these are the baby dragonflies in the picture, they um, might spend f up to seven years in the water before they come out as an adult. So it's a significant portion of their life, and hence they are um, susceptible to pollutants. Uh, we're very excited if we find some of the sensitive <coughs> microinvertebrates like the caddisfly larva or mayfly larva. Uh, that indicates the wetland quality is very good. Uh, to find those critters in the water, we use two methods. One is uh, we use recycled pop bottles. That's what that woman has in her hand. The, uh, it's cut and the top's inverted to make a funnel, and then it's placed in a bracket, and then it's submerged and left underwater. That it's called a bottle trap. It's left underwater for two nights, and the next time, next day, we come back and filter out the water and the mud and find the critters that have swum into the trap, and then they're not able to get out. Uh, we, we do preserve, that means we do kill and then preserve and then identify, sort, and count all the critters that we catch. And then the, those numbers go into the metric or measurement forms to determine the health of the wetland. And then in July, we go out and survey for plants. Um, here's our, wet, our Burnsville team uh, with four corner stakes marking a 10 by 10 meter plot and then measuring tapes to you know, measure it up to make sure we have a nice square plot. And once we get the plot, we will walk through the wetland in a pattern so we can cover all the different parts of it, of that 10 by 10 meter plot, and write down all the different kinds of plants that we find and indicate their relative abundance, you know, like, like they're throughout that whole plot or just in a little corner or whatever the numbers are. We make our list and check it twice. <laughs> And then that data goes into the worksheets that help us determine the, res the, the final score. And on this chart, the, the letters IBI refer to um, Index of Biological Integrity. It's a, a scientific <coughs> method of figuring out a, a score for that wetland. So uh, this summer, we worked in Red Oak Park, Sunset Pond Park, Kramer, and Crystal Lake West. And those are mapped out on your handout the ones that are in the black bold type with the names, those are the ones we were at this summer. And Kramer Park, we've looked at for about 20 years in a row, every time, every year we go out there. Crystal Lake, um, many of those same years, about 15 years, and then Red Oak and Sunset are some that we've revisited over the years, not every year though. <coughs> so, um, they all scored moderate for macroinvertebrate and vegetation, except the Red Oak came out with poor for vegetation. And that one might, you know, seeing a poor score, if there were resources available, it might be good to do plan a wetland restoration. And, and that's the, the kind of thing that, that Liz will be working on, figuring out which ones need a little help or are doing fine. 
And here's the same map you have in your handout. So we, we did Red Oak, Kramer, Sunset, and Crystal. And each wetland in the city is unique and um, different. And it's, it's really enjoyable to, for me, and I think my team as well, to put on waders. We have chest waders, and we walk into these wetlands. And you know, you walk in cautiously, because some of them, the, the muck is going to be very deep, and you have to be very careful how you move so your foot comes up when you take a step and you don't tumble over. And then some of them have more of a gravelly bottom, so it's easier to walk around. It's real interesting. And uh, Liz, could you join me? We have some slides that Liz developed here. Why don't you go back and just talk about this one for a second. Like Diane mentioned, um, Sunset, sorry, Kramer and Crystal West, those are our reference wetlands, and so those ones we go back and visit every year. Um, whereas the other two wetlands uh, vary. So I may select a wetland based on maybe there's some kind of activity going on, like at Terrace Oaks Park, we were doing some habitat restoration. So um, for a couple of years in a row, I chose a wetland nearby just to see, you know, kind of did that wetland have a, a response at all? Again, this is just a tiny snapshot in time, so it doesn't really tell us the whole story, but at least gives us some information um, about that wetland. Um, and you can see on here, we've done Crosstown Park, which is right in, down in the heart of the city. Uh, Terrace Oaks Park, there are several wetlands in there. Some of them are connected to our stormwater system, some of them are not. Um, Sunset Pond we did this year. Uh, that one, it's the same. So Sunset Pond, it's a pond, but it is uh, different areas of it. Uh, the area that you look at is the same area every year. So um, it's a good reference because it's such a large body of water um, and not all of it is what you want to look at. So with the Wetland Health Evaluation Program, they're looking at a particular type of wetland. So the site selected at Sunset Pond is that marshy wetland in which we want to do the data collection. Um, just like for Crystal West. I mean, it's a very small pond, and you guys do the same, same, same area every year. Every yeah. year. Uh, so, yeah, we, trends for Kramer. Again, trends is a really loose term. This isn't uh, a lot of data, it's, you know, a snapshot, one day or one overnight <laughs> sampling during a season. So um, it's really uh, difficult to say exactly, you know, is this wetland um, doing really great this year or really bad this year? Again, it's just a snapshot. Um, the macroinvertebrates are done in June um, and in July, the plants. And so again, it's just like one day out of the whole season, once a year. Um, and so it's really hard to, to uh, uh, I guess, predict what uh, any one year, how a wetland is going to look. I mean, if you can see from Kramer, uh, back in the early, when we used to, uh, back in the early season, 2000 time, I mean, invertebrates were excellent, but the vegetation was, you know, pretty moderate. It wasn't great. And then the next year it was reversed. So what was influencing that? Was it weather? You know, without you know getting a lot more more data, we, we can't really say why, but we do know that if we were excellent and moderate for a number of years, and then for three years we were poor, something's definitely going on. So again, it's a really general snapshot, but it does give us that um, that look at it. Same with Crystal West. What happened in 2011? The invertebrates are really low. Maybe that was a really dry June. And without water, your macroinvertebrates, those little aquatic insects, aren't going to do so well. So maybe that's what was going on that year. So what does the city do with the data? Um, like I said, basically we can kind of track changes over time, especially with those reference wetlands where we get data every year. Um, some of the other wetlands, uh, again, it's you know maybe a snapshot every few years. But still, it gives us a reference point, and it's data that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, we haven't uh, done a lot of selection of, of new wetlands. Um, mostly we're re revisiting ones like for this next coming, for 2018, when I select the two wetlands in addition to our two reference ones, um, I'll be looking for what was going on in a particular, particular park. Is that where I want to uh, um, have the volunteers go out next year or is there something else that's happening? Um, the picture on the bottom here, that's a uh, restoration area at the dog park at Isle Magnet. So, you know, this would be something that we would consider when we look at those, 
those areas is like, well, maybe we want to take a look at this wetland the following year to see if there was any kind of impact. Um, also, are we going to identify a new invasive species? Uh, probably most of the wetlands you were at, there was some reed canary grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and some invasive snails. Right, and some invasive snails. So if they can find something that we've never found before, that gives us a leg up on trying to, um, to do something about it before it comes a, a big issue. And as far as our volunteers go, um, I mean, we've had great, I've been here for seven years, and we've had a, had a great team every year. Uh, Diane, this is your, how many years of being a team leader? Found, well, I, I was a team leader for the city of Burnsville for three years, and no, sorry, city of Farmington for three years, and then about seven years with Burnsville, then I took mm -hmm. 10 years off and did dragonfly surveys, and then I came back last year, volunteered under Bernie DeMaster, he was the leader, yeah. and then Bernie passed the baton to me again. And Bernie, how long have you been a volunteer? Probably close to 10 years yeah. that I've been involved in the program. Hmm? Right. And team leader for what, two, three? Team leader for two. Right. So um, how many volunteers this year would you say? I had 12. 12, and how many were returning? Mm, maybe just you know, one. Yeah? Maybe two, Nick. Nick and Bernie. <laughs> okay, okay. So we do get some new people, and, and I know um, some years we get, uh, the year before, I know there were several returning volunteers, but it really gets uh, our residents a chance to interact with other people from the city um, and to actually get out there in a part of a, a park, natural area that they hadn't been before. And these, these people, they learn a lot. It's a great opportunity. It's free education. Uh, they do a, a day long, or is it a full day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, full day of training of mat for, uh, uh, to learn about macro neuro roots, and they also do a, uh, a class on learning how to, to identify vegetation. So uh, especially, you know, someone who is maybe thinking about going to college or grad school. Um, how many young people did you have this I, year? I had three college or just finishing college yeah. age students or volunteers, I mean. So, uh, you know, gives people, uh, maybe you're retired, it gives you a chance to learn some new skills, meet some new people. So it, it's a great way just to uh, not only get some data about these wetlands, but really to, um, uh, I think, increase the excitement of, of some residents about, wow, you know, we have this wetland and what is that? We have this, they can find something new they've never seen before. So um, basically just get outside and appreciate our, our natural resources here. Right. Do you? Thank you, yeah. So again, it's a, a great example of uh, citizen science and a cooperative program between citizens, cities, and counties. So uh, if you would like more information, there's a wonderful website, minwep.org. And I hope you'll continue to care about wetlands. Any questions? Thank you for that presentation, first of all. Um, yes. Uh, so that was wonderfully informative. So, commissioners, there's no um, action required on this item. It's just uh, for an update for information. But do you have any uh, comments or questions about the WEP program in the city? Yes, Commissioner Rowe. I just have one question, by the way. Thank you, everyone, for especially for volunteering. Appreciate that. Um, if, if new volunteers, if they want to join the team, what is the process? What time frame they have to apply? And if you guys can, please uh, share that the camera, so you, can, sure. you may have more volunteers coming in. Yes, uh, to volunteer, well, first take a look at the website, uh, and that will give you details. But I think it would be like February, March, April, when um, people want, would want to go to the website. It's actually, um, you'd want to join the team in Dakota County if you're looking for the Burnsville team, or if you live in Hennepin, um, click on the Hennepin County part of the website. Um, but you can sign up as a volunteer for either Hennepin County or Dakota County and then uh, indicate your interest in the, the Wetland Health Evaluation Program, and then they'll contact you when the first training session comes. Uh, I'm thinking that might be in May. Uh, the first thing is an outdoor field methods training at a wetland where they actually show us how to collect those bottle traps. Oh, and I didn't mention another way to collect those critters is with a net. We have a very large net with a mesh bag that you dip into the water and scoop up to catch those critters. It's really fun. <laughs> so I hope people are, will follow up by checking out the website. And everything's provided. So the volunteers don't have to have their own 
waiters. Uh, they really, they don't need uh, anything other than their time to come out to the site. Yes, and we welcome teenagers. Uh, if they're you know a little bit younger, we'll need an adult, like a parent with them. Uh, and we do provide the waiters. Um, so you probably want teenagers who are getting a little bit bigger because the waiters aren't kids' size. <laughs> and, and it's really hard to walk in them if they're too big. Any other questions? Uh, Com Commissioner Ralph, go ahead. Is there any minimum education or any other requirement that you guys have? Good question. No minimum education requirement um, because the training is provided. Okay. Yes, and like I said, it's not not super technical. I mean, you, if you, you can tell the plant is a cattail, you don't have to know what kind of cattail. You know, it, they make it as easy as they can, but also there's, there is a lot to learn, and I'd recommend doing it more than one summer to learn more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else from the commissioners? Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. We understand that wetlands are important indicators for overall environmental health and quality. Um, leading up to volunteering and monitoring the status of the wetlands, are there any uh, actions that Dakota County residents can take to, to ensure water quality health from their own perspectives? Oh, great idea, a great question. Um, just simple things like um, not dumping things down your storm sewers, because that water goes right to the wetlands or right to the river. Um, you know, if you're washing your car, we, we pull the car up onto the lawn and wash it there, and then the suds go down into the grass and gets filtered before it gets into the water system. But um, just doing things that keep the water clean will be helpful. Um, keeping litter away from the wetlands as well so the animals don't ingest it. Build a rain garden. Mm -hmm. So um, City of Burnsville, we also host in the late winter into spring these uh, free workshops. There's a free introductory workshop where residents can come and learn about rain gardens and the benefits um, not only the rain gardens, but native plants. And if they choose to, they can go on to what's called the advanced workshop, which is a uh, two evenings uh, out of out of your your. Uh, I think it's two evenings a week, and um, just for one week. So it's just two evenings. Uh, but uh, uh, some uh, some staff from Dakota County Soil and Water Conservation District they come and they teach these classes and they bring uh, aerial photos of your property and help you develop. The uh, not, not only choose the location, but the plants, and, and they'll follow up with you and do an on-site check. And so that's, that's a huge way to help with water quality in general. Um, what else? Um, shoreline restorations. Rain barrels. Rain barrels, yeah. yeah. To, a, to a lesser extent, but certainly rain barrels can capture some of that runoff. Um, do most people think, OK, so um, when, when it rains, your, your water goes into the storm drain. Um, and there's a misconception among some residents that that water gets treated, which obviously it doesn't. So that's one of the messages we're, we're trying to get out there with the, the workshops in the spring. And spring is um, April? Um, there yeah. is, I believe the first intro workshop is in February. Okay. So there's a February and an April one. Um, and I believe the dates were just posted on the website. So if you go under to, to the natural resources section of the city website, there's information there. And so all the registration is handled by Dakota County Soil and Water. So essentially we're just hosting it. Um, and when we host it, it will be held at the library, obviously with the renovations going on. Uh, usually we have it here at City Hall, but uh, the library has been a really good space for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else from the commissioners? Um, okay, no action again is needed. So thank you once again, Diane and Liz, for your um, presentation. And thank you to Nick and Bernie for your service to the community as well. You're welcome. Thank you. That will bring us to our next item of this evening, which is to review the Lake Marion Greenway, uh, Kelleher to Sunset Pond Park segment. Our presenter this evening for that topic is Julie Dorshak, the Recreation and Community Services Manager. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I do have a number of uh, people here to, that are gonna help me with this presentation on our preliminary <coughs> plan for our Lake Marion Greenway. Um, we have with us John Mertens from Dakota County, Rob, Robert Slipka from WSB, Allison Harwood from WSB, and also um, Gerald Jacobson is in the audience. Um, he's our natural resource manager. Oops, went too far. 
Um, our agenda tonight, we're going to go through the overview of the Lake Marion Greenway um, and talk to you about all the different pieces of that. We'll talk you through the preliminary al alignment that the trail will follow, the wetland delineation and plant survey information, uh, timeline and cost estimates, and then um, a lot of opportunities for comments and questions. If you have any questions as we go through our presentation, please feel free to ask us as we um, Bring the, are talking about those pieces. Um, if there's anybody from the public that would like to address the commission or have comments, we do ask that they would wait to the end of this presentation um, so that they can hear all of the different pieces of information before they ask us our questions. The Lake Marion Greenway is the Burnsville segment that we're going to be talking about is 1.8 miles um, that travels from Sunset Pond to Kelleher Park. One of the questions that we heard quite frequently um, in our open house discussions with residents was, where did this plan come from and how long has it been around and, and how did it get to this point? And the answer to that is Dakota County started with their Greenway Master Plan and it was adopted in August of 2013 as part of their Greenway Vision, which was established in 2008. Um, Dakota County is one of the major contributors of this project, and John Mertens will be coming up here shortly to kind of walk you through what the, Green Mar what the Lake Marion Greenway completely looks like. Um, it was also part of our 2030 Comprehensive Plan, which was written and established in 2010. It was part of our par Trail mar Master Plan um, that was completed in 2012. It was identified as a high-priority segment of the, our trail system at that point in time. The City Council, and you may recall that you had a joint meeting with them um, back in July of 2013, where a resolution was passed um, to support the Lake Marion Greenway. And one of the leading areas of interest that was identified in our most recent Parks and Recreation Master Plan was the addition and improved trail connections for our community. So this trail is very much a needed component for the City of Burnsville. It's been identified as such. And we've also had two open houses recently um, in April and August of this year where we had about 60 residents come and participate and give us their feedback. And so what you'll see here is um, our revisions and our um, changes that we've made in conjunction with those open houses. So now I'm going to bring up John Mertens from Dakota County. Good evening, commissioners. Um, so what you're seeing in front of you is a map of the Dakota County vision of greenways. It was adopted, as Julie said, back in 2008, 2009. The idea is it is a re-envisioning what a regional trail system looks like in Dakota County as more of an interconnected corridors linking parks, open space, water, habitat, and community activity areas. Uh, the, idea, the idea is it would serve as a foundation for trail loops within loops that connect destinations and provide multiple recreation opportunities. So all the greenways uh, show uh, connectivity to the rivers and to our regional parks. So, they, so it's a 200 mile network is what's represented on that map. There, I just uh, in orange was is highlighted the generally the Lake Marion Greenway. Uh, the Lake Marion Greenway um, was first identified in the park system plan in 2009, and it travels 20 miles uh, from downtown Farmington up to the Minnesota River or or to the Rudy Kramer uh, Nature Preserve, which is the terminus point of the Minnesota River Greenway. Um, along the way, it, it connects along the south. Creek from Farmington to downtown Lakeville, so a nice connection between the two downtowns. And then from uh, downtown Lakeville, it travels along uh, Lake Marion uh, on existing trails, up through Ritter Farm Park and into Murphy Hanrahan Park. And then from Murphy Hanrahan Park, it connects through Kelahar, uh, Rose Park, and onto Sunset Park. So it really does a great job connecting the many uh, natural resource-based parks within these uh, three, four communities, uh, including the Scott County area, Credit River. Um, and, and these greenways, uh, they take a long time to develop. They develop one little piece at a time. So 
a comparable project that we've been working on over on the Mississippi uh, River is just nearing completion, and that's been a 20-year uh, development project. So, um, so this, uh, the vision takes a while to come together, um, but uh, we and we can't do it without our partnerships with our cities. I mean, uh, cities um, in many cases we're utilizing their city park land, utilizing existing city trails, um, and and when it's all pieced together, then Dakota County assumes uh, much of the ownership and operations of, of the corridor. Um, uh, so with that, I think uh, if you have any questions for Dakota County uh, perspective, uh, I can answer. Otherwise, I pass it on to uh, Robert. So, okay, thanks. Chair, Commissioners, my name is Bob Slipka. I am with WSB and Associates. I'm a landscape architect with the company. and. We are being retained by the city and the county to provide design support for preliminary design of the trail. So what I'm going to do, and Allison as well, we'll kind of walk through in a more finite level, kind of the alignment of the trail and just kind of how we arrived at, you know, where the alignment is at. <coughs> one of the <coughs> other questions that did come up, obviously, the schedule is one. Another very common question, you know, for the diagram was, you know, the question of utilizing the CP rail corridor. And uh, we've continue to talk with them and they've not at least expressed interest in allowing utilization of that corridor at this point in time so it is noted if you look in the the finer <clears throat> the finer print from the county's map but you know it is a long-term goal you know to utilize that corridor but what we have done is really what we're showing tonight is an, an alternative alignment um, which is how to get the implementation of this trail to happen without the utilization of that corridor um, we will still need permitting, especially at the Highway 42 underpass, you know, to temporary easements through there. And we'll continue to work with the, the, the railroad, I guess, you know, more or less to try to get some sort of agreement as to how we're going to implement that. The hope is uh, John Powell, who's uh, one of the engineers with WSB, is, has been mainly the point person with those communications, but we haven't gotten a lot of response from them. So we feel as though moving into this level of design where we will actually submit paperwork for easement requests that that will maybe inspire them to start talking to us more so and we can circle back to previous conversations of the possibility of still utilizing that corridor as a trail piece instead of going through the approach that we're doing right now and kind of a segmented piece through city parks, public right of way, and, and you know, permanent easements on private property. Um, like I said, and as Julie kind of indicated, we're going to run from um, really about Murphy Hanoran Park on the south all the way up to Sunset Pond Park. We utilize um, mostly public right away for a lot of on street trail, but then we're also utilizing Sunset Pond Park. Uh, we're working with UTC and Ames Construction to utilize permanent easements on those properties. And then we will also go on these the western side under Highway 42, utilizing the underpass there, uh, avoiding the rail corridor segment. Um, again, UTC and Rose Park, and then going through the Keller Park, you know, where we eventually connect to Murphy Hanoran. And I'll just kind of run through this in a little bit zoomed in segment just to kind of let people understand where we're at. <clears throat> I'm going to start in the north and work my way to the south. The green line is long range kind of planning uh, that is on the county's plan. So the, the kind of magenta or pink line is the current alignment that we're talking about in this particular study. What we will be doing is starting right at the edge of the parking lot, kind of connecting at the parking lot to um, the existing trail that does exist in Sunset Pond Park. And then moving right away to the street and utilizing public right away. So. What we're going to do is just take public right-of-way sidewalk and widen it to meet the, the, the multimodal trail requirements of, of walkers, bikers, joggers. Um, the residents uh, and the two public, public open, the two public open houses that we did have um, did express some concern. The alignment initially went north of the parking lot and north of the play area and kind of connected um, kind of right up is where our original connection point was kind of right up in here at my cursor. And so the alignment ran along the north side of the park, <coughs> avoiding the parking lot in the play area, but you know, through multiple open houses, they expressed concern of there's a, um, a child care facility that does utilize a playground area and then the park users. And they just thought it'd be a very conflicting thing. And there's a drainage easement on that north side also. So following some site inventory, we've kind of shifted that alignment. to so the current alignment is to actually come, you know, again, down the public right away and then just turn right into the park where we'll connect down to the existing segment. 
the crossing, um, that was one other question that came up was actually the crossing um, <clears throat> is, is not intended to be improved. It, it meets kind of the current requirements that the county looks for. It's a four-way controlled intersection, so there'll be improvements to the ped ramps. But aside from that, there's no additional signalization or anything that's proposed at that particular intersection right now. Um, moving or continuing on to the east, uh, we do make our way around um, towards the Ames construction or um, site down here just north of Highway 42. We'll utilize again public right away, making our way around. Uh, there were some questions that came up with uh, the Boulder development, which is um, right in here. There's two drives, uh, one public right away and one you know semi-private drive that comes out. So we will be you know exploring putting stop bars in. That was some concern that came up from some of the residents within that development of just you know the concern of bikers and walkers going through there and people come out of those driveways and they really don't pay much attention to the existing sidewalk users that are there today. So we have explored some options of how we can at least somewhat improve the, the conditions there to make the residents more aware that there is a trail coming across that corridor. And then the first permanent easement uh, I was talking about was under Ames Construction. So we'll utilize their property predominantly going across the north side of their parking lot and then skirting along the west side of the rail corridor property, which will then lead us underneath the Highway 42 underpass. As we make our way under there, obviously um, going into Rose Park, then the intent uh, at this point is to, again, avoid the rail corridor. So we're going to go between the western abutments of 42 and the supporting columns, the first set of columns down in there. So uh, we've already worked with the county and looked at kind of the construction as built plans of the bridge that, that are there. And we, we feel as though it's, we're going to do some retain wall work down there, but we can get the trail at least to be an underpass and not an at grade crossing, which will alleviate you know that, that risk or concern. The trail will continue really along the eastern peripheral of the park, again, just staying out of the current rail corridor and then making a, a turn across towards um, judicial crossing. Uh, there's a few driveway aprons that we kind of were looking at the best crossing here. So we do have a mid-block crossing that's proposed where we'll actually narrow the curbs down a little bit and, and put in and crew ped crossings. UTC is, again, really in support of what they've been kind of players since this in the very beginning. They're very supportive of this. Uh, they, they do like to have this facility for their employees to go out and walk and use the trail. So they've been working with us and the city and the county on trying to fest, find the best means, alignments, where the actual crossing makes the most sense, that it can be dual purpose with their employees as well as trail users. Um, UTC, again, is up here at the top of the page. We make kind of a long run <coughs> down judicial at this point. Uh, again, this entire segment will be within the western right-of-way corridor. The trail will pretty much hit the outer edge of the trail and we'll just build the wider part towards the curb line so there'll be a little less green space there, but that'll still allow us to not do any acquisitions or easements along the properties in that section. And then we make the movement into Keller Park. Um, so again, this will be where we utilize city park property, make our way down the hill and then down into the, the, the wooded area, at which point we do know we're going to have to make our way to the wetland crossing. And so the, this diagram that you see right here is all at grade. You know, there's no really wetlands that we are going to be needing to kind of work with, but we're staying within the park area. Um, there may be a couple landings along this segment that we kind of see may happen. We're still working on the preliminary alignment of that and how the grades may work out. But we have identified that the gradient may require a couple landings just to kind of meet the ADA and the regional trail requirements. I'll bring Allison up to kind of talk more about the um, wetland and environmental studies that we've been doing as part of this park study. Um, question from uh, Commissioner Donaldson. A um, couple of questions, especially on the Sunset Pond end. When you say that you're going to use the existing parking lot, would the trail be defined going through the parking lot, or would it just be the parking lot becomes the trail? No, so as it, as it currently stands right now, the, the trail comes across and it actually hooks into the drive. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't actually connect right to the parking lot. It's, it's probably about 20 or 30 feet just south before the, the parking lot drive makes its turn out to the street. So what we're going to actually do is bring up, we'll bring the trail in and really hit it across the drive. Okay. So we'll kind of come in, we'll remove some curb, but it'll be in really in a parking lot drive, I guess, crossing just prior to the parking lot. And then with the underpass, um, how close is it going to, would the trail actually come to the train tracks? So right now there's, it's a 
it's the way the bridge is set up is there's kind of the two abutments here and there's two sets of columns down below with the railroad tracks in between. We're going to be outside the columns between really the, the abutment and the columns. So there'll be columns separating us from the railroad tracks. We're really trying to stay out of the, um, the property of the rail corridor. So we'll be, you know, I think it's, I think the rail authority, if I remember right, I think they have something around 30 or 50 feet. I can't remember what the mm -hmm. width is. So we'll be at least 20 to 25 feet from the center line of the rail, um, but we'll have the, the supporting columns separating, you know, from where the trail to the track, we'll have that structural piece there. Uh, there is some vertical height we're gonna have to deal with and some extra retaining walls. So there'll be a fence in there as well, just for fall protection. So it will be separated by a fence and some walls just because of the vertical grade we're gonna have to kind of work with. Has CP said that they plan to use the tracks at any time? They, uh, they have not expressed any interest uh, in terms of, or long range forecast and what they're gonna do with the track. They just, at least at this point have, Express that they don't want to give up that right, but uh, like I said, but we, we will circle back with the easements. It, we, we've kind of heard that there may be more interest as of recently than when the conversations first started a few years back. So as like <clears> I said, we, we've tried to kind of reach out to them a little bit with, with no return phone calls. So we just feel as we move through the earlier design stages, we'll submit a letter that says, you know, we are gonna be seeking temporary easements to do construction on your property and conversations will start at that point. And one of the first conversations will say, you know, we could avoid doing all these temporary easements if we can just figure out a way to utilize the actual corridor and that would alleviate some of the extra retaining wall and permanent easements on Ames and UTC property too. We can certainly utilize that. That would make it a much simpler process with just one property instead of multiple. Good. Anything further? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Um, so as Robert mentioned, there were several natural resource studies that happened as part of this, uh, the planning portion of this um, alignment selection and so the beginning of the process um, we met with the city of Burnsville staff and also with the DNR because the, the large wetland um, that you see right where my cursor is is a DNR public water so they have a regulatory authority over that so we met with the DNR and also some members of city staff and through that process we learned that there are um, several unique plant and rare plant species that are um, out or in or near this site. And so the first thing that, the first study that was conducted out there was a rare and endangered plant species survey for, and this survey is for a specific plant species called the kittentail. Um, the kittentails are species that grow in the upland, so not the wet areas, but up on the hills. And so this, um, this area where the black and white dotted outline is, those were the areas that were surveyed for kittentails and there were some identified. We're not able to show the locations of those um, for public viewing, but there were some identified within these areas that were recorded. Um, city staff has that data and then that data was sent to uh, the DNR as well for their natural heritage information system database. So after the kitten tails were identified, the next step was to move on to the wetland. So as Robert mentioned, there's going to be a rather large crossing of this DNR public water. And so the information that we'd gotten from the DNR and city staff was also that there were some um, potentially rare plant communities within this wetland, uh, areas that are referred to as calcareous fens. So the DNR did some preliminary work just to identify whether they thought that these plant communities were potentially out there, and they did confirm that they, um, not that they found, not that they confirmed calcareous fen, but they found characteristics that would um, make them believe there could be calcareous fens out there. So cons considering this is such a, a large wetland, our next step was to figure out, okay, well, how can we actually narrow down where this where this trail corridor could go. So uh, what we did was we actually used a drone to work and worked with the DNR on site um, and flew over the wetland and used the drone to help the DNR and ourselves identify um, not only high quality look areas that looked like they were high quality, but also, and maybe more importantly for this piece, um, areas that were low quality, because we would want to put the trail across 
more low quality areas and not impact um, the higher quality wetland plant communities. So through that, we identified kind of this red corridor that looked like it had some uh, lower quality wetland plant communities in there. And so then finally, we went out and we did a wetland delineation in those areas. Again, because of the size of the wetland it, and the fact that the trail will only cross over, um, cross the boundary at small sections, it didn't make sense to do a delineation around the entire wetland. So we picked these um, potential crossing areas to conduct that wetland delineation. Um, that was completed in August and the city, city staff, um, the DNR, and other regulatory agencies reviewed that in September and October, and so that's been approved. Um, the next steps will be to, uh, once the trail alignment is set, to meet again with the DNR and find out what their um, permitting process is going to look like. Yeah. Um, how do you identify a low quality? It's just overrun by invasive species, or what is it that makes it low quality? Yep, so primarily what we were looking at in the, with the aerial photo and the um, drone survey was what plant species are available out there. So we're not getting to the level as the WEP program where they're looking at invertebrates and things like that. We're more looking at, you know, if it's overrun with green canary grass or um, narrow leaf cattail, that kind of thing, or purple loosestrife species that aren't desirable in wetland communities. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. No, so <laughs> Allison, city staff, county, DNR, they kind of helped dictate, I guess, in a lot of things that happened. And that was one thing that we did hear a lot from the two open houses that we had as we were exploring three different alignment options. But I just kind of leave this diagram for now. We we had a not, you know, what we kind of considered to be the northern alignment, which really, obviously, as it sounds, we kind of tried to skirt up and around the northern side of the wetland and try to really minimally avoid doing as, as much boardwalk and keep it as on great as we possibly could. And then we had really the center of the crossing alignment, which, you know, one was coming through here as the red box kind of currently showed. Another one was actually skewing across diagonally to the southwest and then kind of making our way up and around. And the last option was the more southern route, which just, you know, similar to the north, it kind of tried to follow along the, the more upland area and, and go along the development to the south. Most residents on the north and south were not very receptive to seeing the trail that close to their properties. And um, it ended up actually working out very well because through the studies that were done by Allison, the city staff, you know, DNR, and other agencies, we kind of found that the center corridor was the wettest and the most, you know, least desirable, I guess. So what we have proposed, um, at, so the stash line is kind of the boardwalk, but what we're looking at right now is about a 1,600 foot, you know, segment of boardwalk, which will start from the northeast corner of the park and then come over and connect right about by the play area. Um, yeah, you know, it used to be kind of Camram Park, but right where the playground container is, so we're kind of trying to hit into the existing trail there. Um, back up one slide. Um, the, the boardwalk itself will again kind of meet the, the regional requirements. So we're looking at a, a boardwalk that's going to be, you know, 12 to 14 feet in width. I mean, like I said, the final design will yet to be determined. We, we've explored a few options and what the material of that boardwalk may be, which will help figure out the pricing and, and what it's going to be available for the material as well as maintenance cost. A few photos here, but I, we have looked at everything from a, a concrete deck to a wooden boardwalk system. We've at this point, the only thing we really have taken off the table is a composite system just due to the, the wetness and the slip, you know, the slip factor that kind of comes in with that. So we maintenance standpoint, it's more desirable for the trail user. It becomes less desirable. So we are doing some pricing comparisons to figure out what may be the best from a construction dollar standpoint as well as long-term maintenance costs. Um, whatever the system will be, you'll have a rail system on there again, whether the rail system is a metal rail or a wood rail. But railings will be required just because the heights that we're going to be at uh, will kind of merit that. So... And then the last really kind of segment is, like I said, we'll kind of come into what I kind of call Camram Park. We'll, we'll run along the existing trail that is there today, widen it, making it kind of that regional trail, trail requirements, and then eventually connect on to the Burnsville Parkway, which at which point we'll kind of follow the southern right away all the way around where the, the project kind of terminates. Some conversations have already begun. Uh, the county line is, is right about in here where my cursor is at. So... That is where John in Dakota County will kind of tell it, but Julie has already begun having conversation with Scott County, and, and conversations thus far have, have said that we were going to get to the Dakota County line and 
transition to the parkway and the on-street trail that was there today, but Scott County is at least currently interested in, in trying to at least get it to the, the intersection right here where they do have a, at least a city sidewalk, and that would alleviate the need of having you know younger families and children having to utilize a small segment of on-street trail and keeping them off-street on a segment there. So. Uh, like I said, and then again, long term is, as John indicated, is is making it, you know, continuing on west further. But this is the terminus of this this segment of trail. But it would be coming down, and then obviously connecting to the Murphy Hanoran and continuing to the south is the long range goal. Um, just a quick timeline. Like I said, we're we're helping right now just do preliminary plans. So what we'll ultimately do is we'll finalize this study with the thirty percent design documents. It'll give us enough detail and information um, to really put together a good cost estimate that will then go forward to council for approval. Uh, the next piece will move into final design, which will start you know, in the early part of 2018. One of the first pieces that will come out of that is obviously identifying where permanent easements are gonna be needed and starting that easement process. Uh, any kind of environmental or wetland permitting will kind of come out of that and obviously the final design. This is a grant recipient, so the plans will go through state aid review. Uh, and then, as it states at the bottom, the construction is right now kind of planned for 2019. Great. I think we only have like one or two more slides. Um, you may be curious about what the final cost of this project is going to be. Um, we estimate that the cost is about $2.5 million, and that includes the preliminary, final, and um, construction management um, expenses for an engineering firm such as WSB to assist us with that. Um, we have three funding agencies that are assisting us with the funding of this project. We have the... Um, a $1.598 million grant from the Federal Transportation Enhancement Grant um, for this construction of this trail. Dakota County is obviously one of our major um, contributors, and they contribute 50% um, to the cost of the remaining costs of the trail and help us to build it. Um, we also received a SHIP grant, which stands for a state statewide healthy initiative program. Um, that was a $30,000 grant that helped us to conduct this preliminary design study. That completes our presentation. Uh, does the commission have any additional comments or questions for our team? Um, I think we'd also like to invite uh, any citizens to approach and uh, if they have comments or questions as well that we can, can hear and address um, first. Are there any citizens that would like to to speak on this project. All right, please approach and state your name and your address for our records. Uh, Nick Rouse, Nick Rouse, uh, 10704 Prescott Court. I had a question about the uh, trail cross, or the boardwalk crossing through uh, through the Kelleher Park wetland. Uh, that's probably gonna be a very significant cost to build that. 1,500 feet, was it? Six. Uh, core uh, trail crossing right there. I was wondering what, what other alternatives do you have to uh, maybe bypass that wetland, maybe on the north or the south side, that would make it a lot uh, less expensive. Bob, you want to come up and let you answer that one? No, first. No. <laughs> no, so like I said before, we, we had a few alignment options. We kind of looked at the north, a central, and a south. The, the northern alignment, after we actually walked the field, a team of us, uh, including the county, city staff, and, and staff from WSB, we actually walked the south loop and around to the north loop. We didn't walk through the center loop, <laughs> but we did walk the north and south. And the, the northern segment, um, we didn't alleviate the cost. That was the initial hope when the county did their, you know, their, their large-scale regional concept at the time was... You know, ideally going on the north side will leave you a lot of boardwalk, but once we got up in there, uh, the wetlands are, are really just kind of wooded wetlands all the way up, you know, right up to the development that's on the north side. So that thought of from an economical saving standpoint was really not viable. We would alleviate going through the core of the wetland, but it would technically still be wetlands, uh, a wooded wetland. Allison can probably speak more technically what it's termed as, but um, following delineation that was done out there is we would still need a boardwalk on the north side and then... Going to the south, you know, again, we had more upland. We had, you know, some of the oak savannas and things down there, but that's what kind of constituted the kitten tail survey. And the mm -hmm. DNR was very concerned with if we did bring a trail through that segment that we would create really a hard paved separation that from an environmental standpoint, we would not allow the plants to move and spread as they naturally would want to. So 
they were not very supportive or receptive of a hard trail through that oak savanna. They really want to keep that as, um, as intact as it was without disruption to it. The materials of the boardwalk is what we're kind of talking about right now. So we're trying to keep the, the, the impact as low as possible. Uh, what we've kind of found in, in recent times is doing a screw-in helical pier system ends up being <clears> the most economical compared to older traditional systems, which would be the concrete pier systems. These are usually done in the winter. It's, it's done with very low evasive, you know, and usually skid loader equipment is all that's really needed out there. They drive out there when it's frozen, they screw them in and they come back during the, you know, during the non-winter months and they can kind of build, sometimes they're even built through the winter. Um, and then what the members themselves will be, really something we'll have to look at, you know, whether it's a complete subframe, which is wood, sometimes the metal frame, because it is a longer segment of boardwalk, sometimes if the contractor can prefabricate the segments and then bring them out, uh, there's cost saving to that. So those will be pieces that we'll kind of talk with some contractors and let them know what, what the scenarios are. And, and they sometimes can provide us feedback as to what, you know, may seem more expensive, like maybe a metal frame, initially sounds more expensive than doing a wood frame, but again, if they can prefabricate a lot of that in a shop and then just bring it out there and just kind of, you know, just snap it together, it, there's a lot of labor costs that are saved by doing that. So mm -hmm. I can't tell you exactly what that is, but I know we're looking okay. at some options, but from an alignment standpoint, that's the key piece. We looked at, you know, from the South has kind of just been taken off the table from an environmental standpoint. The Northern alignment still has, you know, wooded wetlands. So we'd still have to do a boardwalk through that segment, even though it wouldn't seem as as likely it would still be required. Thank you for your comments. Um, other comments or questions from uh, citizens? Okay, seeing none, um, I'll come back to the commissioners for questions and comments on the project. Yes, I just have tweeting. one question. Uh, was there a, uh, an estimate on the duration of the project? I realize it's uh, slated to begin in 2019. Was there any sort of uh, estimate on about how long? No, most for the for this typical segment, usually you kind of see like a year to a year and a half is relatively typical. I mean, a lot of it is again is, is within right away. So probably the the most challenging piece is going to be the under forty two components, which is uh, not really complicated, but there's going to be some retain walls and some structure that's going to be put in prior to putting the trail in, and obviously the boardwalk would be the the second component. But there again, too, if a lot of the asphalt work can be done during the the core summer season, a lot of that under structure of 42 and the boardwalk stuff could kind of carry through the winter. So there, there's a possibility it could really be done within about a year's time from mm -hmm. one season to the other. So that's true. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Dawson. Back to sunset Lake bond. Um, the, it there at the park, it actually splits and goes around uh, sunset pond, but the Western side was completely redone when they had the sewer project that went through there. Um, and so that part of the, the um, pathway is probably, well, it's obviously newer and it's a little bit wider. Would there be any plans to redo the, the other side of the, the path? Or would you just stick to that western side? Well, from a regional standpoint, I can, I mean, from a local standpoint, I'll see if you know, Julie wants to answer that one. But <laughs> for, from a regional standpoint, there's, there, there, are, there are design criteria that we have to meet. So we, we do have to kind of adhere to the, the you know, county or regional trail segment. So there's, in terms of the sharpness and the grade, you know, the, the vertical gradient of the trail and mm -hmm. how sharp the curves are, there's design centers that we do adhere to. Um, like I said, we, we did have some public open houses and some of the residents brought up concern as to why we're going at least right now, it's you know, programmed for the long-range plan. As a long-range plan, it would go up the eastern side and not the western side. So there was some conversations of going back and forth. And what we've kind of found is between, you know, at least through WSB and the city and the county, as we said, you know, when that next segment happens, there may have to be a little bit more assessment as to what maybe is the better alignment option and where does where does the kind of the design standards best fit within the context. And it may be rebuilding what is somewhat of a newer trail to make it more regionally acceptable or perhaps it stays on the eastern side and we find a way to make that one work but that has not been figured out yet okay. <clears throat> commissioners other comments and questions yes <clears throat> commissioner Newman. so you mentioned multiple times around the sunset pond and also down by burnsville parkway that there'd be a requirement to expand the current width of the trail how much wider does it need to be and then what kind of materials do you anticipating for use of the trail i'm assuming this is an asphalt Asphalt will predominantly be the material, at least where it's, you know, at grade. Uh, so on 10 feet is, is typically what we kind of target is 10 feet. You, you can occasionally go down to eight under like certain circumstances, but because it is multi-purpose with, with bikes and walkers, 10 is kind of that minimum that we do try to target. So what you usually find is city standard sidewalk, you know, can vary anywhere from plus or minus four or five feet. Sometimes they're larger than that, but 
we'd be looking for everything in this segment that you've seen uh, this evening, that everything be 10 feet wide. And then again, too, where there's places where there's railings and things, so in particular where like there's going to be retained walls like at the 42 underpass and like the boardwalks. Again, from a regional standpoint, you have a two-foot shoulder as, as terms of a, a buffering space, so that fence or that structure isn't right up against the trail. So, area like that, you're going to see it even wider than you know than that width. But okay. Um, anything else, commissioners? Um, I have a question about the the underpass. Um, it will be will it be lit for safety? Yeah, um, yes. probably. Yes. So, um, yes, that um, has been a, another one of the comments that came out of the open house, and it is identified as being underneath the, uh -huh. the corridor for it to be lit. Okay, yes. and I was wondering um, if it would be possible or if it's been looked into to use um, solar energy to um, light that area, or if it could Certainly. be looked into. Yeah, I mean, certainly, like I said, yeah. we haven't got into that yeah. level yet, but I mean, it's yeah. certainly something we can talk to. I mean, again, there'll be probably a, a lot of vocalization from the county in terms of, you know, them being the owner of the bridge, but, you know, they, they have been very supportive thus far, knowing from a security standpoint that we're going to have to have, obviously, some sort of lighting down below there just to, you know, obviously ensure safety as well as minimize vandalism. And okay. Um, and then back to the boardwalk, it sounds like it would probably be um, a little bit more um, costly than the other section of the trail, but I think it will also be um, one of the most beautiful parts of the trail that will attract uh, a lot of residents that are in that area and a lot of people that will come just to walk the boardwalk through the wetlands. Um, so I was wondering if there could might be um, any plans for accommodations for folks, like benches, to, to kind of pull off to the side and just, just enjoy being there. Um, Instead that, of being that's in one the way. Piece, that was one piece that does come up. We even even the you know the, the city and the county have already talked about that, as well as some of like Allison and stuff of interpretive opportunities where people can have that that aspect of it. So what would happen is yeah again from the regional trail standpoint we would have that, but you'd have these slightly cantilevered or pull off areas, no different than like a bench on a trail where we'd okay. have these segments that would be off. So we widen the boardwalk a little bit, and it might be an interpretive kiosk. It could be. Um, it could be more of a hands-on, but yeah, we, we have talked about utilizing that to some degree for interpretive opportunity. Because I've seen that done on other trails throughout the city, and it's, mm -hmm. I think it's really well received. Um, and then I think the last thing I have is, uh, um, will it be marked in any way? So if you're just a, a, a casual cyclist um, and you're on a public right-of-way, will, will they know that suddenly that they're on a trail that they could actually... Um, go um, quite a, quite a bit ways farther. I really know that they're on the greenway suddenly. I think I can answer this question for for John. Um, yes, the Dakota County has a series of um, greenway systems, and they'll all inter interconnect. Um, so there'll be a kiosk at the different trailheads, and so one of the places that there will be a trailhead would be at the Kramer Nature Preserve. There'll be a trailhead there. There's one at the Black Dog facility, and perhaps we can add a kiosk to um, Kelleher Park as well um, to identify it as being a trailhead for the the greenway, and then people would be able to do wayfinding and know where they are and how much further they need to go to get to a certain destination and know how long that that route would be. Okay, trailhead markers, but nothing like on the right away path that, that they would look down and see like um, marking and. Like oh I'm on the I'm on the Greenway I should I'm keep let going. John answer that question <laughs> as a Dakota County employee. Uh, that's uh, still evolving exactly how we uh, provide that continuous uh, uh, branding, um, but for sure we'll have regular signage that will have kind of the Greenway theme or the Greenway or, or the county uh, branding on it. So this, the signage will be you'll know you're somewhere else than a regular uh, trail. So when you come to intersections, it'll say destinations that are maybe to your right or to your left or, or destinations up ahead. Uh, so, so we do have a system for uh, signage, um, but as far as uh, pavement markings, uh, we haven't developed one yet. Okay. It's just a wonderful project, and I'm excited for, for citizens' residents to know where they are and know where they can get. Um, yeah, Com Commissioner Donaldson. So to follow up on, on that, um, are there identified places for parking? I know when I go biking in some other areas, we have to find places to park before we can get on the trails. 
So as a, as a complete greenway corridor, there there will be trailheads every three to five miles, depending. And, and most of the time, they're in partnership with existing city parks. Mm -hmm. So the, we would share in, um, in well, development of new trailheads or in utilizing existing city facilities. So, Thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions from commissioners or s anything from staff? Nothing. Okay. And again, no action is required in this. It was just for um, review and to provide comments. So um, I think that wraps up this segment. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you uh, Julie, John, Bob, and Allison for your presentation. That brings us to the sixth item of the evening, which is an update for Recycling in the Parks by Jeff Reddick of our uh, Assistant Public Works Director. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Jeff Raddick, Public Works Director. Uh, my job here is mostly coordination of all the maintenance activities within the Public Works Department. Uh, and recycling in the parks has kind of landed in uh, my lap in the last uh, two years. Um, so I'm going to give you a, an update on where we have been since an uh, update about a year ago uh, with the Recycling in the Parks program. Uh, the commission is no stranger to uh, recycling in the parks discussion. Uh, I think, believe it started around 2012 uh, with Nicollet Commons Park, and they, our recycling staff and park staff have researched many options um, to start a larger program. In 2014, we started a pilot program in Cliffen and uh, Neal Park building, and the great takeaway from that is we needed we needed a dedicated program to do more than we were doing um, and really in, really we took this on in 2016 before our last update last year uh, really pared down the recycling in the parks program and proposal to uh, be budget friendly <clears throat> it was almost a year ago today uh, we presented uh, the proposal for the current Recycling in the Parks program, uh, which would be take the best management practices um, for outdoor recycling programs and apply them to our 22 community parks. Um, we found the significant majority of the recycling materials appear in the larger community parks. Um, we got down to probably realistic garbage and recycling receptacles, uh, did identify a need for a recycling truck and additional seasonal employee. Uh, since last year, uh, staff has brought the Recycling in the Parks proposal, as you saw it, to the all-day work session at the, for the City Council, and their direction was to include it, uh, include the program in the 2018 uh, budget discussions. Uh, that discussion happened in August uh, at the Max Tax work session. Uh, where the council direction was to include the program uh, as to be funded for at least for the first year to come out of the restricted portion of the sustain, uh, the sustain, sustainability fund. Sorry. Um, and since that time, uh, we've been working feverishly to uh, toward implement, implementation of the program and uh, things we need to uh, get done before we can start the program up. So I guess from there, uh, we've been working on the longest timeline issues. Uh, one, one thing is the truck. Uh, trucks are, after budget approval, it's probably 90, day get, 90 days to get the truck built, another 90 days to get the box built. Um, and then we got to deal with, okay, now we have all this recycling coming in uh, to the program, how are we gonna, how are we gonna match that material? Um, traditionally, in our garbage program, we've been hauling directly to a landfill and pay the tipping fees at the landfill. This one, we are trying to utilize our partnership with base management uh, and get a larger dumpster at the maintenance facility and trans basically act as a transfer site instead of a direct haul site. Uh, receptacles. Uh, Kind of what we've landed on. Um, most of me, these are uh, best management practices, conveniently located, always paired recycling and garbage. 
Uh, color coded, uh, we finally have landed on that. Uh, you see in the upper left, they're black on black. Uh, that's no longer, no longer acceptable. So when those are, uh, when those are retired, they'll go black and blue. Um, restricted openings, at least on the recycling portion, um, signage and graphics, and park appropriate. So the upper left, as you look at it, would be Nicollet Commons Park. Lower left is uh, Cliff Fen Park as they currently exist. And I guess our lower, our lower option is on the right and that would be our community parks. Uh, we'll get, we'll get, get that option. Uh, currently all the garbage barrels are now black um, and bagged and the recycling will be barreled with uh, restrictive openings. We haven't quite worked out the signage and graphics uh, for the other for the for the community parks yet, um, and haven't really haven't settled specifically on a restrictive top uh, yet. We're still weighing some options there. Uh, parks, uh, as we talked last year, there were 22 community parks uh, since the Marks Parks Master Plan, and and over time. Uh, Park designations change as the community changes. So there's now 20 uh, community parks, and then we threw a couple of neighborhood parks in that have uh, a good amount of recycling materials within them, uh, still get to 22 parks. This is what we plan to start out with. Uh, as all programs kind of evolve, uh, kind of look at what we are getting for recycling in the in the parks and maybe try some other parks uh, to see if there are more recycling available in other parks um, as we continue to go on. Uh, our, we are, the amount of garbage or recycling in the park system isn't gonna change and we're adding employees so there's opportunities for actually more um, than we curr currently are doing. Uh, but we're gonna start out with 22 and kind of pair and work with uh, recreation, you know, as things are programmed in other parks, uh, maybe start re recycling in that park, see if it uh, see if it produces more recyclables on a different park. So, ah, yet to be done. Uh, still got to order a truck. Uh, the the truck is in the CIP. Uh, the CIP will hopefully be approved on the December fifth uh, council agenda. And shortly thereafter, we'll get to uh, ordering a truck. Um, still got to work on receptacles, restrictive covers, and signage and graphics, um, little stuff. And routing and frequency, hiring a seasonal. You wouldn't think hiring a seasonal is difficult, but uh, nowadays finding a seasonal that wants to work hard and work with uh, recycling and garbage is, is a tall task. And then implementation and, uh, and just adjusting and fine tuning. As, as I stated, uh, we're, we're starting with the 22 parks and our objective is to get the most recycling of the budget allowance that we're given. Um, so we're gonna change things and adjust things and try things to get them the largest amount of recycling to happen. And traditionally, uh, well, what the long lead time for the truck is what we're what's going to hold us up we're shooting for memorial day 2018 uh turnout of this program so and like i said our goal is to get uh as much recycling as we can for the for the budget that's allowed us uh our recycling staff believe 60 to 80 percent diversion is a, is possible within our athletic sites in our larger community parks. And if you take the whole program all, uh, overall, uh, they believe we can probably get to a 50% diversion of recycling. So uh, I put those as optimistic goals, uh, similar to the 75% uh, diversion goals of the state. Um, it's gonna take a while to get there, uh, but we'll continue to work at it. And other than that, uh, the program hasn't changed a lot since uh, the last time you saw it. Uh, it's just basically waiting for city council approval and we've gotten all those, so we're, 
we're ready to roll on on this as the budget's approved. And I'll take questions or comments if you got them. Um, commissioners, again, this, there's no action required on this. Um, but if there are questions and comments, they are welcomed. <clears throat> Anything? Um, uh, yes, Commissioner Newman. So um, I'm sorry, I wasn't here for the November session. So I guess I have a couple questions that you maybe covered at that point in time. So how often is this pickup? Is this a weekly pickup, just like the trash, or is it less frequent than that? Uh, Chair, commissioners, uh, pickup varies with sites. Uh, normage, normal garbage pickup on our community and parks would be about three times a week. Um, and with, with we think recycling will be about similar in uh, in those type of parks. Uh, the big sites, Lac Levon, all those that that depends with the softball and baseball games that go there. It's usually daily uh, garbage pickup. Usually Lac Levon is seven days a week. Uh, Al Magnet seven days a week. Um, so we'll ramp that up, and I guess there's there's a little bit of a a gamble here in that the amount of garbage and recycling will stay, or the amount of material will stay the same, and they'll kind of balance out. So hopefully our garbage program will see less volume and we can shift some of those employees to recycling to manage, manage the days of the week as similar to the garbage program. So one other question. Um, so the receptacles, I'm assuming every, there's more than one per park. So is it kind of like a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of garbage and then recycling? Or there'll be certain areas that have recycling and, and other areas that don't have recycling but garbage? No, it's best practice one-to-one, -one, um, all the community parks. If you have a garbage receptacle, you have a recycling receptacle next to them. So that that's the plan. Great. Exciting. Anything else? Um, Thank you for the presentation. I know the, the citizens and residents of Burnsville will um, appreciate seeing the receptacles. Um, as far as sustainability and environmental choices go, I think people want to make a good choice, but you have to make it easy and convenient. So thank yes. you for providing that. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is miscellaneous. Uh, commissioners, there were a few items that I listed in your packet. I'd just like to run through those quick. I, um, again, much like the recycling in the parks program, it looks like it's going to happen. There are a few things that um, you folks are able to cross off your list of special um, activities that you've been working on over the years, and, and uh, the parks master plan is one of them. Uh, that was approved by council on October 3rd, so um, thank you for your work uh, and your time put on that uh, project. Um, the Alamagna Dog Park entrance and expansion of the small dog park area. Uh, that project was completed, uh, I'm going to call it 99% completed by October 27th. There's a new entrance there. There's an ADA accessible ramp coming out of the parking lot. Uh, the gates are wider so that folks can get through them in some areas. And uh, there's a concrete pad that gets you all the way into the park. So um, those improvements are, are really nice so far. We're still waiting for one uh, small electrical panel to be uh, replaced so that it's it's compliant as well. Um, safety fence at Nicollet Commons Park. Uh, you may recall we talked about this in, in length one evening. Um, it, it, that fence is now up. That is up uh, was up as of November 3rd. Um, it's just on the intersection area of uh, 126th Street and Nicollet Avenue. It does not run the length of the park, but it runs that length right by where the kids play by that upper pool. Uh, and it looks very nice. It blends in really, really well, and I think it was a job well done. Um, and then uh, a few other things. Uh, the second phase of our our, um, our Parks Master Plan is underway. We are still seeking public input um, on how to best prioritize the Frameworks Plan. So we have uh, put another survey up on the burnsville.org slash parks plan, and I would encourage all of you and anyone listening at home to go online and Tell us exactly how you would like us to see us prioritize our, our uh, items that have come up in the Frameworks Plan. And then last but not, newly, but not least, the Winter Lighting Ceremony is scheduled for Wednesday night at Nicollet Commons Park. I hope you can attend. Uh, should be a fun event. Always is. And then um, work session? 
Uh, the next uh, meeting is going to be on December 4th. Uh, it will be a work session format. Uh, annually, we take a look at our, specially, uh, our special activities that we would like to see tackled uh, during the next upcoming year. And then we're also going to take a look at the city council's ends and outcomes and see if there aren't any things that we can add or, or reduce off of that list or help encourage them to add to their list and one of our things we do on an annual basis. So. Thank you. 6.30 okay. or 5.30? 5.30 is the lighting ceremony. 6.30 will be the work session. Work session. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, then, that's, that's it then. That's it. Okay, that brings us to the end of our formal um, meeting agenda. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion adjourned. Um, motion by Commissioner Tweedy and a second <coughs> by Commissioner Brammer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye as well. Um, it is so moved. Uh, thank you for attending or watching the Burnsville Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting.